Harrison? Here. Alexander Mace? Precious Malabanan? All right. Nick Malkar? Gage Riley? And Michael Timko? Okay, that's everyone. I thought there were eight people in class. There's only seven. All right. Well, that's cool. Everyone's here. Yeah. All right. Um, are you all familiar with uh, the use of Canvas? Is there anyone who's not familiar with Canvas? Uh, if there are some questions, you can, you can by all means ask me in lab. The way the course is structured is that there is a lecture that runs for, uh, from 9 o'clock till 10.40. Uh, and then the lab runs from 10.45 to 12.25. I believe. All right. Um, so there's time for you to work on your assignments in the lab, um, and you can ask questions. And you can ask questions about Canvas or the material in class or, or, or whatever. Um, so if you have questions about Canvas, by all means, you can ask them there. Um, the way the course is structured is when you log on, you ha will have a home page that will show you any announcements that were made. In this case, there's one announcement, which I can actually get rid of. All right, so there's no announcements. Um, there, uh, if I do have announcements, uh, they will be posted there. Uh, there is a syllabus, and a syllabus, think of it as kind of like the roadmap of how we're going to get uh, from now to the end of the semester. The big page where most of the material on, uh, is on is modules. Now, your screen is going to look a little different than mine, uh, but um, you will have a module for each week. All right? So right now, I've done the first two weeks. So you should be able to see modules, one, uh, modules for week one and module for week two. We do. Um, there is, um, in, each, uh, in each week, there will be at least um, initially three things, and then additional things will get added throughout the week. There'll be uh, two or three things. Um, there'll be a list of the things, uh, the main things that we're going to cover this week, uh, to, to do this week. Um, for example, for the first week, we are familiarizing ourselves with the course in Canvas, understanding what HTML is, and so on and so forth. The activities that I would like you to do, and then finally, the assignments. There will also be in each folder uh, an assignment that you will do and complete and turn in via Canvas. There will be additional handouts um, as is needed. In addition, this is where I will put the recordings, the video recordings, and any examples we covered in class. So later on today at some time, I will have the recording uh, for this class posted to YouTube. Um, and uh, I'll have a link to it posted here. And any examples we cover in class will be found here as well. Usually I'll post a video, and then underneath the video will be whatever examples that we've covered in class. So uh, you can easily tell which examples belong with which video. Um, you do have in front of you a little um, microphone. And it is recommended that you press it if you ask a question. Um, not, not right now. Um, yeah, unless you do have a question. But um, what that will do is that will turn on a microphone. It will turn the camera towards you. Um, and it will turn on a microphone so that the recording can pick up what your question is. Uh, I've mentioned this to every one of my classes, and I don't think a single one uh, person has ever pressed the button for the microphone. I don't know if they're in a witness protection program or they're camera shy or what. But uh, because of that, what I often do is I'll often repeat your question just so that if you go back and watch the video later, you hear the question and the answer as opposed to just hearing the answer and having to guess what the question was. All right? Uh, but the recordings and the examples covered in class will be in the week uh, modules as well. So most of the material of the course is in the modules, and it's divided by week. With the exception of there is a module for the semester project. Uh, we will we will not be uh, talking about this in too great a detail today, other than to introduce you to the fact that there is a semester project. You'll develop a small website, um, and you'll develop it in two phases. 
Uh, the one phase will be you will design it, and the second phase is you'll actually create it. Um, we'll talk about that more in class. Um, what I would suggest for you to do is read the first three handouts um, sometime over the next week or so, because in approximately a week-ish or so, we will be talking about these handouts. So it would be good if you can read those three handouts um, before we discuss them. Um, the labs simply have a description of what you're to do. Sometimes you'll create one page, sometimes you'll create two pages, and so on. But in, for this first lab, you'll create two pages. Um, and then you'll upload it here. All right. Dis discussions will be uh, if you have any questions that you want to ask between classroom sessions. Um, and you think other people in the class would benefit from them. You know, the way I see it, you can, you know, if you have a question, there's a number of ways that you can get your question answered. You can post a discussion or you can send me an email. Well, think of that as the difference between raising your hand and asking the question in class and coming up and seeing me after class and talking to me one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. If you send me an email, if it's something that relates specifically to you, maybe a problem that you're having with a particular uh, piece of material in the class, or, um, you know, um, a problem that you're having with your particular project. You can't get the links to line up correctly or, or something like that. That would probably be best to, to send an email. Think of a discussion posting to be a more general question that you think other people in the class would benefit from. So, for example, um, if uh, the syllabus says that something is due on Thursdays, but the date actually is a Wednesday, and it's, there's an inconsistency, you might ask, which date is it due? Is it due on Wednesday or Thursday? Well, that's something that other people in the class might want to know as well. So questions like that would be better put uh, in the discussion forum. Um, there's a place for you to check your grades. There's a place where you can see and, and contact other people in the class. There's a place for me to take attendance. All right. Um, what I want to do now is review the syllabus uh, tab. And um, I'm not going to review line by line. You know, I trust that you can read the syllabus on your own, and you should read the syllabus um, on your own. Um, but I do want to hit some of the high points, um, some, of the, some of the points that um, I really want to emphasize and make sure that you, that you understand uh, clearly. All right, here is a, on the top is a list of ways to contact me. All right, there's a phone number which um, is best not to call me on the phone, all right? It's best to send an email. The reason for that is, especially during the summer, I'm only on campus a couple times a week, and I typically don't check my voicemail when I'm off campus, all right? So if you need a quick answer to something, you'll get a quicker answer if you email me as opposed to if you uh, send a, a, a voicemail. Uh, my email address is this, mzellers at lorainccc.edu. And you can also send email to me on Canvas. All right. Uh, one thing that I offer, again, this being a, a, an in-person class, uh, might not be used as much as in other classes, but I do offer the opportunity, if you have questions and you're having difficulty understanding material, uh, an opportunity to Skype with me. So for example, if there's something that you're just not getting and a problem, and sometimes we can exchange email, sometimes that takes a lot of time as we go back and forth and we don't quite understand the question, and you don't quite understand the answer, and so on and so forth. Sometimes it's better just to sit down and talk face to face. Well, you know, you may not necessarily want to drive all the way in to do that, so I offer the, the option of, of uh, discussing via Skype. So we can arrange a time that we could meet uh, on Skype, and the, the nice thing about that is I can actually see what's on your desktop, and I can tell you, see line 15, you forgot, uh, bracket or something like that in it. And, and you, you, know, you, can, you can get the answer to your question a lot more timely. The point of all this is that there's a lot of ways to get a hold of me. There's in class, you can always ask questions. This is a small class. There's only seven people. So each one of you represents approximately 15%, 14, 15% of the total class. So that's a big 
fraction of the class. So if two of you have a question that's over a quarter of the class has that question. There's an old professor saying that if one student has a question, chances are other students have the question too. So if you have a question, ask it. There's a real good chance that other people have the question as well. All right. If you don't want to talk to me during the class, there's always a lab session that we can talk to things on a more one-on-one -on -one basis. So if, again, there's something more specific to the problem that you're working on, uh, we can talk about it in lab. Uh, I don't have uh, formal office hours over the summer, but I can arrange them. If you need additional help and, and you can't get it done in lab or whatever, we can arrange a meeting um, at some mutually agreeable uh, time and place. Um, you can always email me, either at my regular LC email address or through Canvas. Uh, and then finally, we have the option to discuss on phone or via Skype. So there's a lot of ways that you can get a hold of me if you want to. But you have to meet me uh, part way. Um, generally speaking, in this class, and I can say it virtually as a guarantee, the people that show up, do the work, do the assignments, are going to be successful in this class. And ask the questions when they get lost. All right. Um, it's it's no secret. All right. I mean, it's not some special secret way to succeed in this class. Show up, do the work, ask questions when you're lost, and I can almost guarantee. I say almost just in case in case there's any lawyers listening on YouTube. All right. But I can almost guarantee that you'll be successful in the class if you do those things. All right, and key to doing those things is when you get lost to ask questions. This is especially true over the summer session. In the summer session, roughly each class session is equal to one week's worth in a regular semester. So we have only eight weeks instead of 16 weeks. So we're sort of doubling up. So normally this class would meet uh, twice a week for about an hour lecture. And here we're meeting and we have about an hour or two hours lecture in lab, more or less, plus or minus. So we're, we're really working at, at, uh, at double speed. So um, that's fine. I, I don't think it will overwhelm you, provided you ask questions as soon as you get lost. Don't think that, well, gee, it'll come to me. Uh, you know, um, Ask the question. All right. Here are some things that describe what the class is about and the outcomes for this class. You can read that on your own. Here's the textbook. Um, in addition to the textbook, um, you need uh, some, some storage media. So in other words, when we work on the machines in lab, uh, when you save something to the disk, it will not be there the next time you come into class. So you need to take a copy of it with you. All right. So you need to either have a thumb drive or email it to yourself or uh, Dropbox or whatever. All right, any number of different ways that you can save the material. But you do need to save a copy of it because it will not be there when you come back. Uh, this is your class, instructor approach. This is your class. It's my job to help you learn the material. All right. So read through this. I do use Canvas to communicate information between class sessions. So please check Canvas a couple times a week. All right. Um, for example, sometimes students will have questions that I don't know the answer off the top of my head to, uh, of. Uh, what I will do is I'll do some research and I'll find the answer and I'll post the answer to those questions. Um, if something changes, for example, if I find that I have a doctor's appointment on a certain day and I'm going to miss class on a certain day, which I don't really expect, but it could possibly happen, I will post that to Canvas informing you so you don't come all the way down here uh, only to have the class canceled. All right, so. Uh, Pardon me? I said, okay, call. All right. Um, so therefore, again, check Canvas between uh, class sessions just to see if there's any updates. Um, occasionally, again, I'll make a typo with a due date or something, and a student will point it out to me, and I will correct it and say, hey, you know, it's not due on July 4th. All right, it's due July 6th or something like that. There's a whole list of college policies that you can refer to the college catalog to get more details on. Instructor policies. I tend to be very flexible about late assignments, provided that um, you're working with me. All right. So if there's an assignment that you're working on and you're just having a little bit of trouble with, uh, with it, um, 
and you are uh, working with me in lab and we're discussing it and you turn it in a day or two late, there's a good chance I won't deduct at all because I know you've been working on it and therefore that's fine with me. Or if for some reason, you know, you're, you're ill and, or you, you have to go out of town for emergency. You don't have to divulge details of your personal life, but just drop me a line that says something unexpected came up, I won't be able to get the assignment done in time. And that's fine. Now, don't use that as a crutch, however, all right? Uh, because at the end of the semester, everything has to be turned in, right? So if you are laid on an assignment because something special came up, that's no big deal. If you are continually late on all of your assignments, that's a sign that something has to change. So you should talk to me. Maybe you need to spend more time uh, working on the homework. Or maybe you need to ask some questions to clarify. And we need to get together and figure out a plan. I had a student last semester in uh, one of my other classes that really did a great job. It was about week seven. Of, uh, of, of a 16-week semester. And he told me he was just having difficulty. And we sat down and we talked about what we were going to do about it. And he, was gonna, he came in to meet me once a week. It was an online class. And he ended up being very successful in the class because he identified he was having trouble. He talked to me about it. We came up with a plan. And then he executed that plan. I mean, that, what more can a teacher want from a student to do something like that? You know, if you do something like that, if you run into difficulties, you know, there's a good chance you're going to be very successful in this class. All right? Again, it's especially important in the case of a eight-week class because, again, you, you know, it goes by real quick. Sixteen-week semesters go by really quick. But eight-week semesters go by even quicker. So as soon as you find that you're having difficulties, um, talk about it and, and we can get it straightened out. Uh, do read for the details of my late policy though uh, here. There's some other things about incompletes. Um, all right, now on to the fun part. How the grade in your class, uh, in this class will work. The grade in this class is comprised of three components that I hope add up to 100 points and they do. All right. There is homework. There'll be homework uh, due every week except this one. Okay, so there's nothing due this week. The first assignment's out there, but the assignment's always made one week and it's due the, the following week. All right, so there'll be homework due week two through eight. All right, and it'll be a total of 65 points. All right, your project design is worth 15 points. And your completed project is worth 20 points. So that adds up to 100 points. Your grade then is easy to calculate. If you're um, 80 uh, or 90 to 100, you get an A. If you're 80 to 90 or 80 to 89, you get a B. If you are 70 to 79, you get a C and so far down the line. All right. If it happens that something messes up and I don't give 65 points worth of homework, I'll prorate them. So sometimes this happens that for whatever reason I skip or ha add an additional homework assignment. So maybe you'll end up with 70 points or 60 points instead of 65. I'll prorate it to make it 65 points. So I'll, I'll do whatever math I need to, to to go and prorate it to be 65 points. Here is a schedule. Again, this is not carved in stone. This is meant to be just a schedule. And notice that assignments are due Thursday of the indicated week. So, your first assignment, Lab 1, is due next Thursday. All right. Um, some of you might find this assignment easy, and because of that, I've put the second assignment out there already, so you can, you can um, get a little bit ahead. If you do complete assignment one quickly, uh, the one thing I would suggest is to read and start thinking about the semester project, because we'll be discussing that soon as well. <laughs> this talks about the chapters that uh, are in the textbook, this, the center column. A couple of things are not really talked about in the textbook. I talk about them um, using my own notes, for example, accessibility 
and design. A lot of these are things um, that, that I bring um, outside of the textbook uh, to class. I don't believe in lecturing page for page out of the textbook. That would, be, that would be horrible. That would be boring for everyone. It would be boring for you. You don't need me to read a book to you. It would be boring for me. All right? I don't want to read the book. Um, my idea is that the book and my lectures complement each other. That um, by reading the book and uh, by listening to lectures, you get um, a full view of the topic. All right. Again, I want to emphasize the things that I think are particularly important. Things are just a matter of reading like some definitions in the book. There's one chapter about text formatting, for example. I'll briefly talk about that, but really you can, you know, once you have the idea of HTML and tags down, uh, the chapter on text formatting is pretty self-explanatory. There's not a lot I feel I can add to that one. So I don't spend a lot of time talking about it in class because you, you're better off just reading it. Now, there's a couple weeks that two things are due. All right? And ideally, you won't wait until these weeks to start working on them. That is the project design and then the final project. So, the project design is due on the Thursday of this week. That would be July the 6th. And the final project is due the Thursday of this week, which would be... Uh, July the 27th. Again, we'll talk in detail about what the project design and the project consists of um, in, a, in, a, in a couple of classes, uh, a couple of classes into the future. But before then, it would be a good idea if you read the handouts on those. All right. Any questions about that sort of stuff before we get into the material of the class? Yes. Yeah, I just have one question. Um, my, um, yeah, just a curious thought that came to my head. Um, we're not going to have class on July 4th, are we? No. Okay, I didn't think so. No, we do not have class on July 4th. Okay, that's all. All right. You are welcome. You guys are welcome to have class without me on July 4th. If you want to pick a park or something and have a picnic or something, you're welcome to do that, but I probably will be doing something else. Actually, if you do have a picnic, tell me what you're having, and then I might show up anyhow. All right? Okay. Um, on to the material of the course. Um, we've all seen web pages, and we know that there's different stuff on web pages. So let's look at a web page that I just picked at. This is a web page that is, is a good web page relating, a good website relating to a web design. It's called a list apart. And let's, let's try to identify some of the things on this page. All right, some of the different kinds of things on this page. What are some of the different things that you see on this page? Just by sort of scanning through it here. What are some of the things that you see on this page that are different? Okay. All right. Real good. First of all, we have headings. Right. The headings. So we have headings. And then we have paragraphs of text. All right. In other words, if we look at this, this means something different than this. Right? This is a headline, or a heading, or a header. This is a paragraph of text. So that means something different. All right? What are some other things that we have besides those two things? We have an image, and we have links. Take a look at a link, for example. Cleveland's Eric Meyer. All right. Eric Meyer is a link. This text is a link, but this text isn't a link. There has to be some way to tell the web browser 
And what is a web browser? The web browser is the program that you use to view your web page. There has to be some way to tell the web browser <coughs> what these pieces of content mean. All right? That this is a heading, and it's also a link. This is a link, and this is just plain text. This, on the other hand, is an image. This is a headline, this is an image, and so on and so forth. There has to be a way for us to tell the web browser what each piece of content means. All right? Does anyone know the language that we use to define web pages? Does anyone know what it's called? It's called HTML. HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. And we're going to consider these two phrases, Hypertext and Markup Language. When we talk about Hypertext, in a nutshell, we mean that it's more than regular text. Hyper means more than. All right, if you say someone is hyperactive, it means that they're more active than normal. All right? So hypertext means that we have more than text, which we've seen, right? This web page has definitely more than text on it. It has text, it has images, and it has links. All right? So, there's more than just plain old text here. All right? Now, the second part is maybe the part that's maybe a little harder to understand, markup language. All right? Let's take a look at what markup means and how we do it on a web page. All right? Some people, I don't know, if you do or not, but some people like to use highlighters on their books, right? Any of you are highlighters in your books? Any of you use highlighters in your books? Yeah, sometimes. All right. Let's pretend that this is your textbook. This, okay. this is our school newspaper. All right. And it doesn't really matter what we're reading. Uh, okay. Okay. Let's. Say that this is your textbook, and let's say that I'm a, the professor lecturing about this textbook. And I say that this paragraph right here is very important, is going to be on the test. Okay? What are you liable to do? You're liable to take your highlighter and highlight it. And maybe put a star next to it, because that's important. What have you actually done? You've actually marked up your book. You actually marked it up with a pen, indicating that this is different than the other stuff on this page. So if I said, for example, this paragraph right here is really important. I'm going to have five test questions about it. You're going to be sure you understand that, so you're going to mark up your book, and you're going to give additional meaning to that book to say, hey, this paragraph and this paragraph isn't the same. This paragraph is really important, so I need to know that. So I'm physically going to mark it up. Now, on the same token, if I were to say that this article here, we don't have time to cover it, so it will not be on the test, you're liable to do something like that. Put an X through it to yeah. say, to say that this is not particularly important. I don't need to study this for the test. So in a way, you're coming up with your own little language, right? Your own little simple coded language that highlighting stars means it's important. I better study it. A big X through it means it's not important for this test. I don't need to study it. So in that way, you're sort of coding the content on this page in your book to give it some meaning so that you know some meaning about these things. All right, let's see how we do that in an HTML document. And we're going to start off simple. We're going to start off with um, 
a not a complete web page, but a web page fragment. All right, we're only going to do a piece of a web page. We'll come back later to flesh out and put the rest of the stuff in, um, rest of the stuff in um, to complete the web page. But we're going to start out with uh, a web page fragment. All right. That's just going to contain some of the stuff. Now, how do we go and how do we put things, how do we, how do we indicate to a web browser what's a headline and what's a link and so on? That's done through markup. And another word for markup is tags. We're going to use tags. Now, what are tags? Tags are little snippets of code that sort of form a language just like this does. So, if I want to designate that something is a headline, and it's the most top, highest important headline, I will put it in an H1 tag. So let's say we're going to do a web page about Lorain Community College. All right. If I was doing an outline for a term paper, maybe my main topic would be Lorain Community College. Maybe a subheading underneath Lorain County Community College would be engineering, business, and IT division. That's one of the divisions on campus. Maybe another uh, um, um, heading underneath it would be allied health. Maybe another heading underneath it would be, subheading underneath it would be math and sciences. So if I was doing an outline, this is sort of my main topic. These are all subtopics underneath my main topic. Now each of these subtopics can have their own subtopics. For example, underneath engineering, business, and IT, we would have computer information systems. We would have accounting. We would have uh, digital forensics. Underneath health, we would have nursing and uh, radiology. Underneath math and science, we would have math and biology and so on. So you see, we could have a topic that's divided into subtopics. And then each subtopic is divided further in the topics. Now the question is, is how are we going to show the browser that that's our outline? We're going to use the header tags, right? How you show the browser and how you define on a web page what anything means is through the use of what's called a tag. All right? And the tag for the most important header is an H1 tag. So let's look at this tag. I'm going to write these up here uh, at first, and then I'm going to go in and I'm actually going to make a web page uh, on the computer and see how it goes. All right, first of all, what do you notice about tags? What you notice about tags, first of all, is they have these two little triangle sort of things. In between these, the less than sign from math and the greater than sign from math is a couple of letters or numbers or something that's the name of the tag. So this is called the H1 tag. And these tags have special meanings to the browsers. Just like you had your special meanings to highlighted and stars mean one thing, an X through it means something else, 
The browser understands that an H1 means it's a top level heading. And so that's how it's going to understand it. And that's how it's going to display it. Now notice again, we have a less than sign, H1, and then a greater than sign. We then have almost the same thing, but with a slash in front of the H1. And that's called an ending tag. For the most part, all tags come in pairs. There's a starting tag and an ending tag. The starting tag says where that particular piece of content starts, and the ending tag says where it ends. So let's like look back at this page for a second. How does the browser know that by chip colon isn't part of the heading? Because this has an ending tag which says that's not part of the heading. That's something else. All right. So this is wrapped in a tag where we have the starting tag, piece of content, and an ending tag. All right. So, the H1 is one of the tags. It's the first tag that we're going to look at. All right. The second tag that we're going to look at is the H2 tag. And it works just about the same, except it is used for sort of secondary level headings. So, for example, all of these would be in H2 tags. Now, here's something not to get confused about. It's not an H2 because it's the second tag. It's an H2 because it's the second level of tags. So you can have more than one H2 tag if two things or more than two things are on the same level. So think of it like you're making an outline. Underneath each H2, you could have multiple H3 tags. And so on. These are all specifying headers, or headlines, or headings. Could we keep it down, please? The last tag that we're going to talk about is a paragraph tag. And that is simply a plain paragraph of text. And that is done with a P tag. So, all tags look the same in the sense that less than sign, greater than sign, the name of the tag, and then there's an ending tag that's paired up with it. So let's go and create this. Let's go and create this web page fragment. Again, it's not a complete web page yet. All right? And I'll try to repeat that at least a hundred times today, that this is not a complete web page. Because even after I repeat it 95 times, I'll still get students that will turn in something that looks like this. No, this is not a complete web page. This is part of a web page. We'll go back in a few minutes and finish the web page after we start it. So I'm going to create a web page, and there's all kinds of programs to create web pages. I'm going to use a very modest program in this class called Notepad++. You can also use plain old Notepad. All right? If you, you have a Mac, there are other applications that you can use. The point of these is these are plain text editors. All right. Why do we use a plain text editor? We want to make sure that you really understand the code in this course. That you don't use some kind of tool that allows you to draw a web page. Because if you do that, you're not really understanding the way um, to use the code and the way to code the web page. And you end up creating pages that are probably not as efficient as they could be. Not as easy to change. 
All right. So we're just going to use simple program. Notepad or Notepad++ would work just fine. All the machines here on campus have Notepad++. It's a free download. You can look for it and download it. Um, again, if you have a Mac, Text Wrangler is one that I use. It's very good. All right. Um, so I'm going to go into Notepad++. All right. I'm also going to make it a little bigger so that you see. And I'm going to put in the first couple of tags. And I'm just going to do the first part of this. And you can almost think of this like if you're writing a term paper where you have an outline with your headings and underneath each heading you have paragraphs. So I'm going to go and put a few headings in. I'm going to put a couple of paragraphs in. I'm not going to write a full paragraph, just enough so that you get the idea of this. And again, I have my end paragraph here. And I'll write a short paragraph about accounting. All right, so I created this, I put the tags in. Let's notice what I have. H1, start H1, end H1. Again, the tags all come in pairs. Start H2, end H2, start H3, end H3, starting paragraph, ending paragraph. Start H3, end H3, starting paragraph, ending paragraph. So as a rule, these tags go in pairs. All right. For every starting one, there's an ending one. And it wraps around saying that what is in what. In other words, the browser will know that this word technology is part of this heading. It's not part of a paragraph, or it's not part of that heading. It's part of this heading. All right, And this is part of a paragraph. It's not part of any sort of heading or anything like that. All right, And so on. How does the browser know that? Because we tagged it. We put markup on it. Just like you had a little code to mark up the textbook, we've marked up the content of this page using these tags to tell the browser what each piece of content means. All right, so let's go and save it. All right, so I'm going to go up under File. Save. And I'm going to save it on the desktop. And one thing that's really important, I have to change this from where it says normal text file to HTML file. All right. And I'm going to give this a name. And I'll call it 
lccc.html. And I'll save it. So now, it's saved on my desktop. And, the brow and, and, and Windows knows that this is an HTML file. That's why you get the little E for Internet Explorer. It knows that this is a web page or a portion of a web page. Okay? In this class, we're going to look at pages two different ways. We're going to look at the guts of the page. We're going to look at the code of the page. Then we're going to look to see how other people in the world are going to view our web pages. All right? Another way to put it is we're going to look at these pages in our editor, and we're also going to look at them within the browser. So the, here is the page in the editor. That shows me the code. That shows me all the tags. And this is what we're going to use to create our web page. We're going to type in all the tags that we need to. All right? Now, that's not what the user is going to see. All right? The user will see this. And how do you see what the user is going to see? By double clicking on the file and letting it open in a web browser. Oops. And I'm going to open it up in Google Chrome. And this is what it shows me. All right, notice what we have here. We have, what tag was this? H1. H1, yeah. H1 means top level headline, most important headline. All right? So, it sort of makes sense that by default, the most important headline is the biggest headline, right? You know, they're not going to have some big news story, man lands on Mars and it'll be type on the bottom of the page. They're going to have it in big type on the top of the page. It's a sort of a human characteristic that by default, if we see something printed, the bigger it is, the more importance we give to it. That's just something that we do automatically without thinking. So by default, the, hot, the, the more important the headline is, the bigger it's going to be. So that's an H1, so it's the biggest. This is an H2, so it's a little smaller than that. These two are H3s, they're a little smaller than that. Okay? These are just plain paragraphs, so they're just normal size font, normal size type. Now notice a couple things. Notice that if I resize the window, the content resizes to sort of match the size of the window. That's a good thing, actually. You don't have to worry about like it cutting off content or something like that. Notice that now this paragraph's three lines wide. If I make it a little bigger, two lines, one line. Now, this is something that some students are confused about. They think that I have two files here. I don't. I have one file. It's lccc.html, lccc.html, same file. I'm just looking at it two ways. I'm looking at it using the browser to show how other people in the world are going to see my web page. And I'm looking at it in my editor for what I'm going to use to create the code, to create the web page to be the way I want it to be. Think of this almost like the difference between a photograph and an x-ray, right? You could have a photograph of me, you could have an x-ray of me. Still only one me, right? It's just two different ways of looking at me. One shows the surface, what everyone in the outside world sees. The other shows sort of the inner workings, all right? And this is sort of the surface, what the rest of the world sees. This is sort of the inner workings of the code. All right? Questions about this so far? One thing I like to talk about is what if you do something wrong? 
What happens if you do something wrong? Well, if you follow the rules for HTML, usually you get the results that you want. I said usually, all right. Uh, we'll come back to that later on in the semester. If you break the rules of HTML, though, kind of all bets are off, all right. In other words, you don't really know what the browser is going to do. It would be like if I gave you directions of how to get to the bookstore, but I, I like used improper grammar, or I used double negatives, or I don't know, I, I, I said some things the wrong way. You might be able to figure it out anyhow. You know, you know if I say walk, you know, 40 miles that way, you might think, gee, I don't think he meant miles, I think he meant yards, all right? And you might be able to figure it out and find the bookstore. You know, I know the bookstore isn't 40 miles, he probably meant yards, all right? If you violate the rules of HTML, the browser guesses what it thinks it's supposed to do. And it may do it right or it may do it wrong. So let's make a few mistakes and see what the browser does. For example, let's get rid of this end h2 tag or end h1 tag. I'm going to go and save it. Then I'm going to go and refresh this. Yeah, didn't make any difference. No, actually it didn't. Okay, it did not. No, it didn't make a difference. Correct. Let's say I put instead of H1, HH1. Well, that kind of thing did make a difference. It doesn't know what an HH1 tag does. So, therefore, it just displays it as plain old text. It's very tricky troubleshooting HTML sometimes because, again, the browser takes its best shot of what could, could again, could we keep it down, please? Sorry. That's all right. Uh, the browser takes its best shot at what it, it, it should do. And, again, it tries, and sometimes it gets it right, sometimes it doesn't get it right. Okay. Um, one thing about tags, one additional thing about tags, is the notion of nesting tags and the notion of white space. We'll actually talk about those two things together. Let's talk about white space first. What do I mean by white space? White space is anything that isn't a typed character. So a tab, a return, or an enter, a space. So I could do something like this if I wanted to. Notice how I changed it from Lorain County Community College on one line to two lines for Lorain College and also for engineering. That has no effect on the page. So white space that you put in, I could put a million spaces. That's not really a million. That's probably only half a million. But I could put a handful of spaces in there, and it has no impact on the way it's displayed. All right? Now, that seems confusing at first for people that are doing this, but that's actually a good thing. All right? Here's why it's a good thing. This will allow you to format the page in the way that you think is most readable. All right? One thing you want to do, one of the, a very important consideration is not just to create a page that works and displays the way that you want it to, but to create a page that is easy to change, to go back and change. All right? And what are some of the things that makes a, a page easy to change? We'll talk about a whole bunch of these things throughout the semester, but one of the things, the first thing that we'll talk about is having your code formatted neatly. So, whatever makes sense to you, you know, does it make sense to have the starting tag and the ending tag on different lines, or 
you can put the starting tag and the ending tag on the same line. The browser doesn't care, all right, because the extra enters, the extra spaces are all considered white space, and white space is more or less extra white space is ignored, all right. So it doesn't affect the way the page is displayed, all right. So you can display this the way you want to. So I could do this and really make it obvious that this paragraph starts here and ends here and really make it easy to read. It has absolutely no impact on the way that that paragraph is displayed within the browser. So that's what I mean about white space. Any extra white space, the browser ignores. All right? Second thing is about nesting. And that's a little more complicated. The idea of nesting is like this. You, you probably have all, or maybe some of you have seen those Russian nesting dolls, where you have like a big, like, kind of egg doll and inside that's a little bit smaller one and inside that's a little bit smaller one until you get a real tiny one. When you talk about nesting you're talking about surrounding something completely. So the idea of nesting is like this. What I have here is properly nested because I don't have any overlap between tags. Nesting sort of, the opposite of nesting is overlapping. I don't want tags to overlap so that a tag begins in a tag but ends outside of it. So for example, this would be illegal. Because the H2 starts inside the H1 tag but ends outside of the H1 tag. All right. This will make more sense when we include, when we start including some of the other sections on our page. But the idea of nesting is that you're not going to have tags overlap this way, where a tag starts inside of a tag, but doesn't end inside of it. The tag starts inside a tag, it's going to end inside that tag. All right. So that's another thing to consider. So let's go and let's add some of the other things to the page to make this a complete web page. Remember I said that this is not a complete web page. This is sort of a web page fragment. Let's go and add the stuff to make this a complete web page. All right. And as I do that, I think that will help explain some of the concepts I just explained a little bit better than maybe I did. So let's go in and I'm going to add the first thing, which is called a doc type. A doc type sort of specifies the version of the language that we're using. All right. The newest version of HTML is HTML5. This doc type says that we're using HTML5. It's great that you're studying HTML5 because the doc type is real simple. The doc type for versions prior to HTML5 were really long and complicated. I never remember what they were. I always just copied and pasted them because I could never remember because they were long and complicated. This is sort of a hint to the browser saying sort of what specific version of HTML this web page is in. That might help the browser figure some things out. All right. So it's a good idea to have a doc type on every one of your web pages. Whoop. That's why I deleted it. Second tag that you have is you have an HTML tag. This tag goes around all of the other tags. This would sometimes be called like the root of the document 
or the root node of a document if you, if you talk about other uh, languages. In other words, everything is included inside of the HTML tag. There are no tags that are outside of the HTML tag. So it wraps around everything. The HTML document itself consists of a head section. And I'll put the head in. And a body section. <coughs> Everything in the HTML document should either be in the head or the body. All right. The body of the page is going to contain everything that you see right here. So everything that you want to see here displaying on the page itself, you're going to put inside the body. Now here's where our indenting is going to come in. Because everything, all these H1s and H2s and H3s and paragraphs are part of the body. That means that they're nested within the body. So I could leave it like this and the browser would be able to figure it out. But I'm going to make life easy on myself and I'm going to indent. Why am I going to indent? Because at a glance I want to be able to see what is contained within the body, what is contained within the head. So I'm going to indent. At a glance, I can see that all these tags are part of the body. They're just indented that way. And as we add more subsections to the page, all right, a page will always have a head and body, but there's other sections that sometimes pages have, sometimes pages won't have. A page should always have a head and body, though. But as we add more of these sections, we can indent further. That way, at a glance, I can see that all of this stuff belongs to the body. How do I know it belongs to the body? Because the body starts here and the body ends here. So everything between the start and end tag of something you can say is nested in that tag. So all of this stuff is nested inside the body tag. The body tag itself is nested in the HTML tag. In fact, one nice thing with Notepad++ is if you notice these little pluses and minuses on the side, you can actually compress sections if you don't want to see them all. If you had a really big document, for example, that you were editing, and you weren't interested in looking at the body, you could simply look to see what was in the head and work on that part, and then the body wouldn't distract you. Or you could expand the body and work on that part and the rest of the stuff wouldn't distract you. Alright, I don't have anything in the head as of yet. Right now we're going to put one thing in the head and later on we're going to add some more stuff. The thing we're going to put in the head is the title of the web page. What is the title of the web page? It will be what appears on that tab. So for example, if I go to a list apart, <coughs> the words up here, a list apart for people who make websites, that is the title of this page. So I'm going to put in the title tag, a page about LCCC. Again, I save it, I can go in my browser and hit refresh, and now I see a page about LCCC up in the title. And if I minimize this in Windows 
and I put my mouse over it, it shows me a, down there the title, a page about LCCC. One thing students sometimes get confused about is the difference between a title and like an H1. All right? The title appears in the head section and it's used on the tab. The, the H1 tag is part of the body and it displays in the body of the web page. So now we have a complete web page. Doc type, HTML tag, head and body, and then a title in the head, and then the other tags that we learned inside the body. Now, I don't know if you noticed before, but I made a mistake. All right. I, I think one thing I try to show in the class is like what happens if you do something wrong. Right? Um, I show that to you partly so you don't panic if you make this kind of mistake. All right, because this, this happens at least once or twice a semester. What if I did something like this? I actually used a less than sign there. All right, let's see if we can figure out. Think in your mind, don't say it out loud, but think in your mind what do you think is going to happen when I go and display this web page with a greater than sign here. A spoiler alert, it's not going to end well. All right, let's take a look. My page disappeared. Wow. Yeah. And again, that happens, and usually students panic. What happened? Uh, my page disappeared. You know, someone, you know, put a curse on me. I don't know, whatever. All right. Let's see if we can figure out why that is. Why did the page, dis why did the whole page disappear? Here's a hint. This is what I messed up. All right. So, what's wrong in this document right now? Is the start title tag correct? Yeah, the start title tag is correct. Is the end title tag correct? No. So, if the end title tag isn't correct, from the browser's point of view, there is no end title tag. All right, because browser sees this, says, well, that ain't an end title tag. All right, and therefore, here's the start of the title, and the browser is looking for the end of the title. This should be it, but I made a typo on it. So it's not there, 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 it's not there and so on hits the end of the document, never has an end title tag, therefore it thinks that the entire page is the title. All right? And therefore it doesn't show anything in the body. If we were to look at, if we could see more of that title, we would see that the whole, yeah, right there, we have our mouse. The entire web page, it thinks is the title. All right? Wow. This is how, this is where it's important to follow the rules because the results, I won't say the results are unpredictable, but the results sometimes you get burned in ways that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Other, and again, the good news here, of course, is to fix it. We simply put the end title tag in as correct and we're back in business. All right. What if we do the same error with this one? All right. What happened here? That paragraph is big. Why is that paragraph the big? Well, we said this is a third level heading. It should end there, but that's not a proper ending tag. Therefore, that third level heading, heading doesn't end, and therefore it considers that paragraph to be part of the heading, and therefore it displays the heading larger. 
we're actually given a little bit of a hint here because we see the tag. You should not see the tag, right? The tag should simply be a code to the browser on how to display the page. Other things, if you don't nest things properly, won't necessarily be a problem. So what if I put an end body tag up here? That's not properly nested. Why is it not properly nested? Because the paragraph tag starts in the body but doesn't end in the body. Remember that's our definition of nesting. If a tag starts within a tag, it ends within the tag. All right. This is where if your indenting is correct, this should jump out at you as, as being a problem with the nesting. Because you can see body lines up with body and paragraph lines up with paragraph. Oh, those two things overlap. Now, interestingly enough, in this particular case, there's not really going to be any problem with it. It's going to display it perfectly well. Just goes to show that if you violate the rules of HTML, you don't know what you're going to get. Might work, might not work. There are actually tools that we'll examine later on in the class that allow you to check your HTML to make sure that you follow the rules correctly. It's sort of like spell check for HTML where it will point out any problems that you have. Any questions about this? Any questions about what we have so far? One thing I do want to review, by the way, is creating the web page, because that can be a little tricky. Uh, either Notepad++ or I'll do this one using Notepad. Maybe. Just the interest of time, I'll just copy this code in here. If you're using Notepad, when you go to save it, you should change it from text document to all files and then end it with .html. So I'm going to I'll just save this as copy.html. Again, you know that you've done it correctly if when you look at your file, <coughs> you see a .html at the end and you see the icon for a web browser. That indicates that you've done this correctly. All right, let's say that I finish this for today. I go, I copy it to my thumb drive, I take it home. I want to work on it at home. First of all, there's no real issue of compatibility between like if you're working on a Windows machine at here and a, and a Mac at home or anything like that because you're just using a plain old text editor. All right, so there shouldn't be any real issue with that. Um, what you would do is, on Windows anyhow, you would right mouse and say open with, or in this case it says edit with Notepad++. The other thing that you could do is you could open either Notepad or Notepad++ and, I, oh, use the file. Use the file browser to file, open, and then navigate to your file and open it. Let's take a minute to review 
your lab assignment that is, again, it's this week's lab assignment, which means it will be due next Thursday. Let's take a minute to review uh, it. And let's take inventory to see if we, how, much, how much of our assignment we've covered and how much we have yet to cover. All right? So let's go back to Canvas. All right, your first assignment, you're to create two web pages. That's due June 13th. That's correct. Okay. Create two web pages. A is using the web, research the following topics. HTML, HTML5, CSS. Create the web page that has an article about each of the topics. Summarizing what you have learned. Each article should contain at least well -written one well-written paragraph. Use the tags covered in Chapter 1. All right. Pick any topic that you're interested in. Create a web page named index.html about the topic. This page should include a page header, three short sections. Use article, section, or aside. A navigation section with links. Appropriate use of headers, a footer section, a list, and other tags. So, seems to me there's three things that we haven't covered yet. And we'll cover some of them today, and then some of them we'll cover on Thursday. Yes? The first one, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, um, yeah it, it, it doesn't really matter. Here's the three things that we need to talk about. Sections of the page. And that includes header, footer, nav, article, aside, section, lists, and links. Let me look at the clock. We have about 20 minutes left. Let's Talk about lists. And then we'll do sections and links on Thursday. All right? All right, Thursday's good. Fair enough. All right. What is a list? Uh, a list is not a full paragraph, but just a list of items. So, for example, if I looked at this page here, computer information system includes networking, software development, web development, and mobile development. Another way to do it that might actually help people read this a little more clearly will be to have a nice little bulleted list. All right? So the bulleted lists are good, and usually people can understand them pretty quickly, and so on. So I'm going to change this. Instead of having these things as part of a paragraph, I'm going to have a list of the three or the four topics underneath CISS. All right, networking, software development, web development, and mobile development. All right. So how am I going to do that? How I do something, how I add a particular kind of content to my web page is always a question of what tags I'm going to use. Because tags are what we use in HTML to get the job done. 
So, if I want a list, I need to know what tags there are for lists. If I want an image, I need to know what tags there are for images. If I need a, a link, I need to know what tags there are for links. So, when I look to do something in HTML, the question really is, is what tags do I use? All right. So, we're going to look at two kinds of lists. And the first one you is, the first kind of list is a UL. UL stands for unordered list. An unordered list is where, is a list where it doesn't really matter the order that you put them in. You just decide an order and you put them in that order, but you could put them in another order if you wanted to. <coughs> if I was, for example, going to list some cool places to go in Lorain County, I might say Lakeview Beach in Lorain, Finley State Park, um, Skate World in Lorain. All right. I just randomly pick three places. I could have ordered them in any order, right? If, however, I was listing the cities, the most populated cities in Lorain County, there's a distinct order, right? You know, I don't know, Lorraine's probably the most populated, then Elyria, then I don't know what third would be. But there's a specific order that it has to be in. A recipe would be an example of an ordered list, right? You should crack the eggs before you put the eggs in the bowl, right? You don't put the eggs in the bowl and then crack them, yeah, it all right? Doesn't work. doesn't work well that way, all right? So an ordered list is where things have to be in a certain order, an unordered list is where you're flexible as the order. So here I'm listing the different topics underneath computer information system. I'm going to put that as an unordered list because I could put that in any order I choose, really. All right? I might pick an order, I might not, doesn't really matter. The UL is what indicates that it's an unordered list. And really the only difference between an unordered list and an ordered list is that an unordered list will be bulleted. So you'll see little bullet points like you see in Word or PowerPoint or, or things like that. Whereas an, an ordered list will show numbers. So it will show one, two, three, four instead of bullet points. So the UL tag goes around all the items in the list. So if I'm going to show the four topics underneath computer information systems, then I have one UL and I'm going to have four LIs. And associated with an LI will be an AND LI. Now again, notice how these are nested. This list is part of a paragraph. Actually, I'm going to end the paragraph and then I'm going to have the list. This UL is, uh, I guess it doesn't really matter. This UL is part of the body. Each LI is nested inside the UL. So if I do that and save it, if I go and hit refresh, whoops. I get a bulleted list underneath it. And as far as writing for the web, things like bulleted lists are oftentimes really good to have on your web page because 
it seems like people don't read web pages the same way that people read novels. You know, people will sit down and read a novel, will read every word for it. Where a lot of times web pages, people are simply scanning the web page to find information. So bulleted lists are oftentimes a good thing to have because they sort of make uh, make it very clear um, without having to read every every uh, every single word on the page. So that is an unordered list. All right, and how do we tell an unordered list? Boom, 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 bullet points. An ordered list we see the numbers next to it. One, two, three, four. So if I was saying the, you know, the, the, the most popular majors of computer information systems ranked by the number of students enrolled in them, then maybe I would do this because there would be an, uh, an actual ranking. Whereas if I was simply listing them in, in an arbitrary order, I would make it an unordered list. So that's about it for lists. UL or OL and then LIs inside of it. Now, before we conclude today, I want to make, because uh, there's one other thing that uh, uh, we're going to hit on uh, Thursday as well, and that's styling our pages. All right? Most of your pages for lab 1A are going to look similar to this. All right? The reason for that is the browser has certain defaults on how to do things. By default, most browsers are set up to have a white background with black text on it. By default. Browsers have a default font. For most Windows browsers, the, def the default font is Times New Roman. All right? By default, the H1's the biggest um, heading, H2's are the next biggest, H3's, and so on. By default, Unordered lists get bullet points. Ordered lists get numbers. So the way that your page looks depends on two things. One of which we've seen so far and one of which we'll see in future classes. One of the things that your page depends on is the, is the browser defaults. All right? So the browser will make your page look a certain way unless you have specified otherwise. All right? So maybe you don't want black font on a white page. How do you specify otherwise? You use a different language for that. And that language is called CSS, or Cascading Style Sheets. So the two languages that we're going to spend most of the semester on, and we're going to study a little bit of one and a little bit of the other and go back and forth between them, the two languages that we're going to study are HTML and CSS. HTML defines the content on the page and says what the content is. <coughs> this is a top level heading, this is a second level heading, this is a paragraph, this is a list, and so on down the line. Later on we'll have images and paragraphs, or uh, we already have paragraphs, images and links and other stuff. HTML defines what the stuff on the page is, what that content is. CSS defines what it's going to look like. And any of the browser defaults we have, if we don't change anything, that's what we get. But we can change any of the browser defaults we have to make it look the way that we want to. So we could make an H1 be way bigger than it currently is, or smaller than it currently is, or a different color or a different font, or any visual change that we want to make to the page we can accomplish, we can change those defaults via CSS. So that's a, a fourth thing that we'll pick up on next time. Sections of our page, links, and CSS. That will be our lecture for uh, Thursday, and that will allow you to do 
um, parts 1A and parts 1B. So what we studied today, if you take this example and, and expand it and, and so on, you could do what we, uh, you could do lab um, uh, 1A. Lab, lab 1B though, we need the additional information on Thursday. Are there any questions over what I covered in class, either about the class structure or the HTML? All right. Uh, I will see you in lab. A, a word about the lab. Uh, the lab is your time to work on assignments and get feedback. Uh, there will be some situations where I will have an activity in lab and I'll let you know about that, but most of the time the lab is your work time to work on the lab assignments. Um, so there aren't like formal, there aren't like lectures in lab or there aren't, uh, once in a while there, there could be an activity, but for the most of the time it's, it's your time to work on the, the assignments and to practice the things that we talked about in class and get your questions answered about that. So the lab is right over there in BU 102 and I'll be there in a minute. Uh, cool. All right, take care.